right then. It's been about two months for me with the Pixel 5. Uh, when I received it, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to hold up compared to everything else out right now with its lower end CPU, but you know, I've used the hell out of it while on a ton of adventures, and so far it's held up really well where it counts, but it does come with a few bummers. Uh, I love the new look. I mean, it's got to be one of the cleanest looking phones out there right now. Um, I've got the just black color because that matte black with the black G on the back just looks so good. It's not an all glass phone. It's metal with this plant based bioresin coating over top with a circular cutout in the metal underneath to allow for wireless charging. I like it. Um, I know some folks don't because they think it makes it feel cheap. Um, personally, I think it's because they're used to all these much larger phones, which of course, way more. Look, here's the thing about the build. Um, it may not feel as premium as raw metal or heavy glass phones, but it sure feels more durable. Plus, it feels way better in the pocket. Uh, as far as the size of it's concerned, with or without a case, for me, it's perfect. Like, if you're the type of person that thinks all the big phones are too big and all the small phones are too small, and this, this is the phone you want to be looking at. Uh, the fingerprint reader on the back works really well, been really happy with it, but it's super duper flush with the back, which you might not have any trouble with, but I sure did. So I tossed on a case after about a week or two so I could find the damn thing easier. Okay, audio quality. Um, like usual, we've got two speakers. There's one on the bottom and one under the glass at the top. Uh, in the past, Pixels have had some fantastic audio, but this year, in my opinion, it's barely adequate. Call quality really suffers as a result of that under glass speaker. Um, that was something I noticed right away. So now I try to avoid calls more than ever. Uh, watching a YouTube video with a lot of dialogue isn't too bad, but listening to music, watching a movie or playing games, mm, no. The display is a six inch OLED with a 2340 by 1080 resolution at 432 pixels per inch with a hole punch camera and no five finger forehead. Now, to be honest, I was a lot more excited for the display size than I was for the resolution, since I'm normally more of a big numbers guy when it comes to displays of any type. Like, I want that QHD plus resolution with 120 hertz refresh rate. Did we get 120 hertz? No, but we did get 90, which at the very least should be adequate by anyone's standards. Did we get QHD plus resolution? No, but we, um, uh, no, but seriously, I think the only time I notice a drop in resolution from what I'm used to is video content. Everything else looks sharp and colorful, although not quite as bright as a lot of other phones, but still plenty bright enough for me outdoors on a sunny day to see what the hell I'm taking pictures of. Now, as I'm sure most of you are probably aware, Google didn't go with one of the newer 800 series Snapdragons this year. This year, they went with the 765G, and I think that decision was actually a really smart move for a few reasons. Like first, I think Google knows that hardcore tech enthusiasts are most likely gonna go with the best that Apple, Samsung, Huawei, OnePlus, and so on have to offer. So by, I guess you could say, selectively compromising on certain hardware specs, they can lower the price and appeal to a larger demographic. Uh, second, with Google's own hardware optimizations along with eight gigs of RAM, which I think Android actually needs these days, you shouldn't notice any real meaningful differences in performance from a phone with a higher-end CPU. I mean, I haven't, and I've been using the OnePlus 8 Pro as my main phone since it launched right up until I got the Pixel 5 in. And third, the 765G sips power from that already healthy size 4000 mAh battery. Like, day after day after day, I consistently hit 6-7 to seven hours of screen on time. And keeping in mind, that's with me using GPS, streaming music over Bluetooth, along with taking pictures all day long while I'm out on the trails. I just wish Google would do something with the charging speeds. Uh, 18 watts is good, but everyone else is doing better and has been for like a few years now. So right as the US election was really heating up, I was averaging about 14 spam calls a day, which was weird because I'm Canadian. Uh, some were election related and some were scammers, but it was really getting to me and my OnePlus 8 Pro wasn't doing me any favors. I get in the Pixel 5, toss in my SIM card, and poof, the call stopped. So that was a pretty impressive example of Google's call screening if there ever was one. Uh, those power menu smart home controls are invaluable to me because with a house full of smart bulbs and like various smart plugs, I don't think the novelty of not having to open any of those apps ever again 
is gonna wear off anytime soon. Uh, finding out what song's playing without having to ask someone or open a third party app makes Google's now playing song recognition feature super, super useful. And of course, I love the simplicity of Google's version of Android. It feels more welcoming than most and the settings are just quieter if that makes any sense. Like, I don't feel overwhelmed when I'm looking to change something. Photos and video from the rear 12 megapixel standard wide and 16 megapixel ultra wide still look great, but I noticed I'm getting a lot more lens flare than I have in the past, which looks cool sometimes, but other times, depending on the type of flare, it can make the image look cheap. And like a lot of phone cameras, Pixel phones prefer light quality from sunlight much, much more than they do from the soft diffusion of overcast days. But Pixel phone cameras in particular seem to perform worse than most on those days. Uh, sometimes I like overcast days for photos because it makes skin tones look softer, more natural and even looking and helps protect highlights from getting blown out. But that can come at the cost of color saturation, contrast and dynamic range, which Google's own image processing hasn't seemed to fix for me yet without the help of manual post photo editing. Um, a lot of the shots I took with the Pixel 5 were in Vancouver Island's rainforest, and so on sunny or partly cloudy days, I thought the colors, contrast, and dynamic range were great. I mean, I got some really nice shots. But on those overcast days, images looked really flat, which pushed me to switch over to close-up texture-focused shots, which do look good, but I really wanted to show off more of the landscape instead of every goddamn half-interesting looking mushroom I could find. Portrait selfies still look good, but edge detection doesn't seem to have improved much over and above what I've seen from every other phone I've reviewed in the past year and a bit. Like, it's good most of the time, but not all the time. Uh, low light shots are really good. Like a lot of the time, all it needs is just a tad bit of ambient lighting and the post-processing does the rest. But when things start to get a bit too grainy and muddy, uh, night sight does its thing and turns grain and mud into image clarity magic. But I think you'll find you don't need night sight as much as you might think. Uh, I'm really happy with a 4K video quality, no stuttering or wobbles from weird shutter speeds, exposure mostly stayed consistent, and colors look like how I described it with photos depending on the quality of lighting and all that. But I was really impressed with the video stabilization after I mounted it to my 4Runner like I did with the Note 20 Ultra and hit the trails again. It's not as good as what I saw from the Note 20 Ultra with that massive block on the back with plenty of room for the stabilization system to wiggle around, but I'd say it's probably around 80% of what I saw from the Note 20 Ultra. Uh, like it might not look like it, but a lot of those rocks I'm driving over are the size of baseballs or bigger, and the trails have a lot of dips and bumps, which, I mean, let's face it, for a phone less than half the price of a Note 20 Ultra, that's pretty damn good, man. Personally, for $700, I think the Pixel 5 hits that sweet spot between value and cost and makes you think about what you need versus what you want. This is one of those phones I could easily recommend to anyone, especially since it's the phone I'm personally gonna keep in my pocket. Well, I think that about does it for this one. Uh, if you've already got a Pixel 5, let me and everyone else know what you think in the comments below. And if you haven't gotten one yet, hopefully this video helped a bit. Uh, if you did like the video, maybe show me some love with that thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't already. But as always, thanks so much for watching and I'll talk to y'all in the next one. Cheers.